today the first accepted talk presentations is going to be given by Chao Ma from Princeton University. So without further ado, uh, Chao, please start. Okay, thank you. Um, today I will talk about the slow deterioration of the generalization error of random feature models. And this is the joint work with uh, Lei Wu and Professor Wena O. And this, in this work, we'll focus on the uh, specific kind of random feature model, which is shown here. Uh, it is a two-layer neural network with the first layer fixed. So we only show in the second layer. And to be uh, simple, we give some assumption on the, uh, the distribution of the first layer parameters. <laughs> like we assume B, B, J, and C, J are independently drawn from uni the uniform distribution over the uh, unit sphere. And we assume sigma is a real function. And a typical phenomenon in the random feature model is the so-called double descent phenomenon, which is also a hot topic of the recent research. Um, actually, a double descent uh, is said to appear on other models like neural networks. But random feature model is a good model to study the double descent phenomenon because it is linear and we can uh, directly solve for the uh, final solution of a gradient descent trajectory. And here we show an example of the random feature model on the MNIST data with uh, 500 data samples. And we can see that the generalization error, which is shown in the, uh, by the blue line, becomes huge at uh, m equals to n. So it is where the number of uh, parameters equals, equals to the number of data. So because of this peak, the curve experiences two descent when m tends to infinity. It is the meaning of double descent. Um, however, if we uh, take a closer look of the gradient descent trajectory, we'll find something different, which is shown in the left panel of this page. Um, if we consider the uh, curve of test error with respect to the number of iteration, and at the case of m equals to n, we'll see that although the test error will become very large, finally, it keeps to be small for a very long time here in this case, as it's small from like uh, 10 iteration to uh, 10 to order seven iterations. And, and uh, it is also shown on the right panel of this page. If we take a small time, if we stop the gradient descent at a small time, then the uh, double descent phenomenon will not be up the up years and the um, test error will be monotonically decreasing as M uh, becomes large. And uh, so this is, uh, we name it the slow deterioration phenomenon. That is, although the gradient descent, uh, although the generalization error will, uh, might become large, finally it deteriorates very slowly uh, over the number of iterations. And uh, this uh, figure gives a clearer uh, picture of this phenomenon. We, here we just uh, pick a randomly, a randomly pick a function from the RKHS. And we can see shown by the um, blue line, uh, we can roughly divide the uh, curve of the test error into three regimes. The first regime is a fast decreasing at the beginning. It is very fast, only costs like one time units. And then it's, uh, there is a long time with good generalization error, uh, which uh, spans all the way from like uh, one to 10 to other seven. <laughs> and um, until that, uh, after that, the, um, uh, the generalization error becomes bad because the, uh, the GD solution finally converges to the, uh, the minimal norm solution. And in this period, in this regime, the uh, test error becomes bad and maybe becomes large. And later we want to uh, analyze and explain this phenomenon. And as an intuitive explanation, uh, we think that the slow deterioration is uh, caused by the uh, small eigenvalues of the grid, the grid matrix and the large test error is also caused by the small eigenvalues. So before the analysis, let's introduce some uh, notations. <laughs> For the random feature model, we have an associated kernel and with this kernel, we can define an integral operator like uh, we show here as K. And under some assumptions, uh, K can be a trace class and can have a merge decomposition. And let's use uh, mu i and psi i to be the, uh, to denote the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of K. And to be simple, let's assume that our target function F star is just the top eigenfunction of K. So F star equals to psi one. 
and uh, let phi, this big phi, to be the uh, feature matrix, and x be the data, and b be the uh, features. And let's do a secret value decomposition of phi, and let phi equals to like u sigma v, and u is a left singular vectors, and v is a right singular vectors. And sigma uh, is the, uh, contains the singular values, lambda i. Then with these notations, we can explicitly write down the prediction function f hat t of the random feature model under gradient descent trajectory, under gradient descent dynamics for any t. So we can see that f hat t is the summation of n terms, and each term uh, is the contrib a contribution of one uh, singular value and, and the associated singular vectors. And we can see that the singular value, which is also uh, the square root of the uh, eigenvalue of the grand matrix, uh, influence this term in two ways. The first, uh, it influences the speed of convergence because it appears in, the in this exponential. So uh, for smaller lambda i, the convergence will be slower. And secondly, it uh, influences the magnitude of this term because it appears in the denominator. So for smaller lambda i, uh, when time, when t is sufficiently large, this term will be uh, larger. Uh, so that uh, partly explains our intuition here. So for smaller lambda i, um, this term will finally become large and contributes to large uh, test error, but this convergence will be slower. It takes longer time for this, uh, for this term to be large. So intuitively, uh, when the number of data n is large, the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, the top eigenvalue and eigenvectors will align well uh, with the eigenvalue and eigenvectors of the kernel operator k. So uh, the top eigenvalue will, uh, the top eigenspace will align well with that of the target function. So um, in this direction, it will converge fast to the target function generating the first regime. Then the following large eigenvalues and the corresponding uh, eigenspaces also align well with that of the kernel operator. But in these directions, uh, the, these directions are orthogonal to the target function. So these eigenvalues, eigenspaces does not contribute much to our test error. And finally, the small eigenvalues uh, produces larger solution and large generalization error, but they converge very slowly. So as a um, theorem, this here we show an informal theorem. And as a formal theorem, we, we need some assumptions and some uh, more detailed description. And then under some assumptions, we have these estimates of the uh, test error. The test error is bounded by the summation of three terms. The first term uh, addresses the first regime, which is a fast decrease, an exponential decrease. Uh, the speed is governed by the first eigenvalue. And the second term is an uniformly small term over time, which addresses the second regime. And the third term is an increasing term, uh, which is also something over the square root of n. But, and this increase, the speed of increase is uh, at most of t. So t have to be uh, at least uh, some uh, polynomial of n for this term to be large. And uh, the bound in this theorem depends on uh, the spectrum of the grand matrix. To make it more explicit, let's consider a corollary in which we uh, assume the uh, lambda k hat decays in a rate no less than one over the square root of k. So that means there exists a constant such that lambda k hat is bounded by this. This is a quite weak assumption because uh, anyway, we need the uh, summation of lambda k hat square to be uh, bounded. So uh, this, uh, so it have to be to decay, decay in some rate. Uh, under this assumption, there exists constant c1, c2, which may depend on lambda one hat, that satisfies that um, the test error is bounded by c1 over square root of n. Uh, for t from c2 log n to c2 n to uh, order 1 over 4. So that means the length of the second regime uh, is at least in the order of 1 uh, n to order 1 over 4. <laughs> okay, as an implication of this result on numerical analysis, let's consider the Runge's phenomenon. Uh, the Runge's phenomenon appears when we do high order polynomial interpolation on this function. And uh, we will see that our interpolant will have very large uh, 
approximation error at the edge of the uh, interval from minus one to one. However, if we consider uh, the same high order polynomial interpolation, but we do not directly solve the coefficients, instead we run a gradient flow, uh, then we will see that the Runge's phenomenon will not appear for a very long time. As shown in the left panel, uh, it, uh, it has a good approximation at t equals to two times 10 to order 10 but the, uh, it finally becomes bad and the Runge's phenomena appears at time two to 10 order 20. And if we uh, take a look of the curve of the, uh, of the test error as shown in the right panel, we will still see the uh, slow deterioration phenomena. Okay, finally, as a summary, in this work, we uh, describe and analyze the slow deterioration phenomenon, uh, both the double descent phenomenon and the slow deterioration are connected with small eigenvalues of a gray matrix. Hence, uh, we show that a large standardization error emerges very slowly. And secondly, uh, this phenomenon shows there's a long period of time in the training process during which the generalization error is small. So stopping in this period does not require delicate stopping criteria. And the double descent is not uh, something that needs to be worried too much in practice. Thank you, that is my presentation today. So for Charles' talk, there was a question that how can we know during the training uh, actually which phase it is currently at? Oh yeah, I have just um, answered that question uh, by typing. My idea is that we actually don't know which, uh, don't know exactly which regime it is in. But since we have showed that the second regime is very long, so that means if, as long as we um, get a small uh, training error and uh, we stop at any reasonable time, then we will get a good uh, testing error. So uh, if, as long as we do not wait for a super long time uh, until the, um, the solution goes, cl uh, goes close to the minimum norm solution and the uh, generalization error deteriorates. I think it's more open-ended, like, uh, can you discuss more the role of initialization in your results? So maybe you can take turns to, to, ask, to say something about it. You mean for me or for Franka? Uh, from, you take turns, so you can, Charles can start first. Okay, so uh, in our study, uh, we may consider zero initialization. Uh, you know that uh, for a random feature model, uh, if you run gradient descent from zero initialization, you get uh, you finally converge to the minimal normal solution. That's a very clear uh, result. And um, <laughs> if you initialize from a different initialization, then uh, of course you can also express it right down the solution you converge to. And compared to zero initialization, compared to the minimal normal solution, uh, you will have a component added to your uh, solution. Uh, because of your initialization. So if you um, <laughs> initialize badly, then this component will always contribute large test error and that makes it impossible for you to even get small test error uh, in some stage of the training. So I think zero initialization is a, uh, is a good choice. But this is actually not the case for uh, for neural networks. For neural networks, it's a non-convex non model and uh, actually we are not so clear of, the, uh, of its dynamics, uh, at least not as clear as uh, our understanding on the linear case. So uh, in the case of neural networks, uh, we are not so sure about, uh, we have some empirical study of the, uh, of the influence of initialization, its scales and its magnitude, and we have just uh, uh, posted a paper on archive, but actually we, we do not have a, a very clear understanding of how uh, initialization will influence exactly the dynamics.